What's keeping millions of children away from school worldwide? UNESCO says it's poverty and discrimination. And coronavirus is making things even worse. So what should be done to secure education for all? And can that gap be bridged? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Peter Dobby. Girls, immigrants, ethnic minorities and the disabled, just some of the world's children at risk of not getting any education. The United Nations says poverty and discrimination continue to prevent huge numbers from going to school. The total was around 260 million children two years ago. And that figure will be higher now because of the COVID-19 pandemic. 40% of low and lower middle income countries failed to support teaching during the global spread of the coronavirus. Many students were cut off from online courses during school national lockdowns. The UN's educational organization, UNESCO, is urging countries to support those left behind as life does begin to creep back towards something approaching normal. UNESCO also found half of the world's children who don't go to school, that's 97 million, live in sub-Saharan Africa. 95 million don't go to school in Central and Southern Asia. Another 17 million in the Arab world and North Africa. And 12 million in Latin America and the Caribbean. Less than 10% of countries have inclusive educational laws. And just 41 out of 195 countries worldwide officially recognize sign language. The UN says educational systems have failed to take special needs into account. Let's bring in our guests. Joining us today on Inside Story from Paris, we have Manos Antoninus, Director of Global Education Monitoring, their report from UNESCO. From Rabat, we have Lassen Haddad, International Consultant at the World Bank, and from Kuala Lumpur, we'll be joined by Man Al Khatib, Professor at the Islamic University of Malaysia. Gentlemen, welcome to you all. Lassen Haddad, this is about bridging the gap, I guess. How do we do it? Well, I mean, it's I mean, like the report, the UNESCO report said something very important. It said that in low and middle income countries, adolescents from the richest 20 percent of all households were three times, three times as likely to complete lower secondary school as were those from the poorest homes. This is very significant. And this is due to the to the fact that the richest kids uh, have better access generally like to private schools in some situations, but also, I mean, the benefits from the capacity of their parents and also of their households to mobilize out of class tutoring and also to social and psychological support from parents. Uh, on the other hand, what we find is like in most public schools attended by children coming from poor and low income families, they suffer from teacher absenteeism, from lack of adequate teaching infrastructure and equipment. There is overcrowdedness most of the times. And there is poor stakeholder involvement in the sense that uh, the middle class families have moved away from public schools to private schools. And so there is like a stakeholder kind of crisis with regard to these kinds of, of uh, public schools. So less interaction between the teachers and the families because I mean, for these kinds of children, that for these kinds of poor children, that's why there is this kind of underperformance. There is this kind of big gap, and the gap is widening. Actually, I mean, in some in some countries, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. Okay, we'll get onto that in more detail in just a moment. Manos Antoninus in Paris. This report identifies three overarching issues: ability, background, and identity. Which of those issues is the easiest to solve? <laughs> It is not really easy for any society to solve the problem of inclusion related to these three aspects of individuals. Every society needs to confront and be frank and honest about addressing this issue. What the 2020 Global Education Monitoring Report does that we launched today is precisely to give a, a bit of more shape, a bit of more understanding into what inclusion actually means, because all countries signed up to ensure inclusive education by 2030. But for many countries, inclusion as a term tends, tends to be associated just with disability. And uh, the report argues that 
the understanding has actually grown because the very same mechanisms that exclude children with disabilities from education, and by excluding, we mean both it keeps them out of school, but also while in school, while in classroom, they don't do as well as their peers. The same mechanisms also exclude other children who may be uh, vulnerable because of uh, belonging to eth ethnicity, belonging to some minority. Uh, uh, it's, uh, of course, being poor, as very uh, rightly was mentioned before, because we should add to this point that it's not only that the three times the riches are three times more likely to complete lower secondary school. Those who do reach the end of lower secondary school, the rich are twice as likely to uh, reach uh, and achieve basic skills. So this is very compounded uh, over the years. Manhatib in Kuala Lumpur, your region, I guess, was ahead of the curve when it came to being innovative with virtual classrooms and children learning online. But that's only as good as your computer infrastructure. So if you've got urban or rural areas, it's a belt and braces exercise, it's back to basics. But in that situation, what happens to children who need to be supported through education but they're not being supported by the school. Uh, yes, you are right. Um, actually, in uh, in countries like Malaysia, for example, the country have uh, laid down quite good uh, internet infrastructure. And uh, nevertheless, when the COVID-19 hit uh, uh, the globe, uh, we saw that some rural areas suffered from uh, lack of uh, such infrastructure. Uh, uh, for example, uh, I myself have a student who has to travel 10-15 uh, minutes away from his home to find um, uh, a good internet service, a Wi-Fi service, so he can use it to join the online meetings with his colleagues. Uh, another student in, in Sabah, she had to, to climb a tree to get a uh, stable 3G internet connection, and uh, she had to even sleep uh, overnight or spend overnight in the jungle to sit for her online exam. Uh, other countries like uh, Indonesia, which is the most populous uh, nation in the region, we are talking about maybe 56 percent of uh, the more than 250 million uh, population have access to the internet. The remaining um, uh, like 44 percent are suffering from uh, lack of of having accessibility to the internet. So having the device alone is not actually sufficient uh, to have stable and uh, good internet connection is very crucial for for uh, providing uh, virtual uh, or learning on the virtual sp uh, space. So um, I think that is kind of a challenge where uh, the government, ha the governments in, in, in general have to look into uh, closing this gap uh, and providing uh, uh, proper uh, internet and, and uh, devices services for the students to be able to cope with their colleagues no matter where they are. Lassen Haddad in Rabat, when we talk about closing the gap here, could the situation actually be worse than we know? Because the data, the numbers of children who aren't getting any form of education, the data comes from the schools. It, therefore, it's passed on to relevant education departments. It's not gathered, say, in a census situation where people from the government are knocking on doors and saying, how many children live here? Therefore, how many children are not going to school properly? Yeah, I agree. And uh, I think the problem of data is really, really uh, important. And uh, the poorer the country is, the less they data reliability exists and i think uh, mostly it's the schools actually who do the data what needs to be done is actually like have census and then in relation to that census you can compare the data that comes to schools in order to see the difference in those kinds of uh, situations but even like even the schools themselves they are not equipped to do the data correctly and also there is a problem with the quality of data that is gathered in so many schools of course there are programs and some of them are supported by international organizations in order to improve the data quality that is uh, that is gathered by schools and also to improve the skills of the school principals and also the school administration with regard to that but i think there is a lot of that that uh, i mean like there are a lot of children who are not 
reported, especially those who do not show up, because we don't know, I mean, like how many of those exist and all of that. And also because there is not much statistics with regard to the sociology of an area in order to compare the, the, the degree and also the level of schooling. That's a very important question, and I think that needs also to be addressed. And, and there are different ways in which it can be addressed. And, and uh, one of them also is to have, for, for example, like a, a social register in which all the, uh, the, the, I mean, like all the citizens are registered with their children, and also that to be updated with the, in relation to the birth certificates. And then make that, I mean, like compare that to the, to the registration that exists within the schools. Mm -hmm. And in that way, you can have really, I mean, like a viable uh, statistics with regard to the schooling and also to who goes to school and who does not go. There are some situations where even like the dropout is not, is not very well calculated. Manos, I'm, I'm going to pause and, you there because that's, that's a very full answer, but there are other areas within our discussion that I, I, I would like to move towards, if I may. Manos Antoninus in Paris. Lest we think this is a universally depressing aspect of being at primary school or secondary school, there are some, some success stories here. Some schools in Kenya, they teach in 21 languages. Now, that doesn't come down to internet access, it doesn't come down to rural infrastructure, it doesn't come down to children having to sleep in a jungle overnight because they want to go and take an exam. That's one of the examples that the report identifies. That comes down to cultural flexibility. So, why is it some schools, this one particular school in Kenya, can teach in 21 languages, but a school 10 miles down the road can't teach in so many languages? Well, uh, it is really uh, a very important question because the uh, issue of inclusion sometimes is not just about money. Often people say inclusion costs. Actually, no, it doesn't cost uh, if you plan in advance to be inclusive. Um, for example, starting from a uh, school building. If you plan in advance to make the, uh, the building accessible uh, to students with disabilities, then that will make hardly any difference to the total cost. If you try to expose, try to correct all the things that were not put properly, that makes the cost very high. And if you look at the classroom, as you said, it's often just a matter of a gesture. An inclusive teacher, a teacher who is prepared to listen to every student's needs and uh, address them properly, doesn't need to do much. Often it's a matter of uh, opening to them the way uh, the teacher groups the children in the classroom, the way the, the, the teacher uses the language that is respectful of all children. Uh, there are so many ways that don't necessarily uh, cost. Yes, it's true, just to bring it back to the data discussion, it will be quite costly for countries to find out exactly what is happening, and that will require perhaps the support of international organizations. But when it comes to being inclusive, it is a matter of a commitment. It's a commitment that goes uh, at all levels. Uh, we just talked about the school, the teachers, the school leaders are, of course, important, how they engage with the community, how they reach out to them to make sure that their voices are also heard. Uh, and then going up to the administration, how uh, responsive and how responsible uh, education officials feel at the county level, at the district level, all the way up uh, to the central level, where uh, different government officials, because we're talking about inclusion, we're talking about multiple overlapping social problems, how the departments of education and health and social protection and the local governments that are supposed to provide these services are talking to each other. Okay, Often, Man Hatib, just, of just let me move on to Man Hatib, please, uh, uh, Manos Antoninus, in Kuala Lumpur. Man, coming to you. How does an education authority, however, or a school, if a country is flexible enough to teach primary school children and secondary school education to uh, teenagers, I guess, in multiple languages or different dialects, that keeps them, does it not, perhaps, tethered to staying in the country? So if you look at an Indian state like Odisha, which some people contributing to the report are basically saying that's the gold standard for teaching in India, especially at the primary school level. But if you teach them in their own language, so many Indians move around the globe for work. So they get the education, but then they maybe don't have the language skills that they need to go and do a university degree or to go and live and work abroad when they say hit their early or mid-20s? Um, yes, language actually is quite um, uh, in this um, open globe where uh, job opportunities are not limited to your country anymore. 
language is a very um, uh, important factor in, in education. Um, in Malaysia, for example, uh, in Southeast Asia in, in generally, uh, most of the countries, their medium of instruction in their schools is uh, in their mother tongue language. Um, and that, that kind of uh, is positive in the sense that when you learn from your, using your, your mother tongue, that gives you better opportunity to understand uh, what you are learning. And it will facilitate learning much uh, easier to the, to the learners. However, when it comes to um, looking into the global market and the availability uh, of these students to, to be uh, employed using international firms, it will be quite challenging. And in, in, in Malaysia, for example, we see this kind of uh, situation where, because in, in Malaysia, uh, schools are actually opened uh, according to um, ethni ethnicity. For example, the national schools are teaching in, in, the, in the national language, Bahasa Malaysia, and uh, we have some schools which are Chinese uh, schools are teaching in, in Chinese, and the Indian schools are teaching in Tamil. And um, uh, among, among these three, we can, we can see that uh, English proficiency is not, is not that major issue in Malaysia yet. Uh, it is not, uh, I mean, referring to, to the uh, uh, workability, uh, there must, they, they might still be a need to work on improving that. In, in, in Malaysia, there has been a debate on uh, teaching uh, science and especially science and mathematics subjects in English. It has been uh, done at one time and then the, the, the decision was uh, reverted again back to using Bahasa Malaysia. So, um, that kind of uh, decision actually is is depends on on the on the in the country itself when okay. we're talking about uh, looking at the identity of of the uh, and okay. the nationality of the people. Okay, Lassen Haddad in Rabat. Seems to me that this is uh, something that has to be achieved. It's a massive jigsaw, and you have to achieve it almost on a school by school or maybe a region by region basis. But is it not that this issue is not? top down, it's bottom up. You've got to get primary school education right rather than get secondary education right as a priority because if the kids aren't educated properly when they're four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old, you're not going to have the properly educated children to then go into the secondary school system. That, that's true and then uh, what happens is like uh, the quality of education at the primary level is really fundamental. Uh, and uh, there are countries which have made like significant progress in, in terms of that, in terms of generalization. So there are a lot of primary schools, I mean, all over Africa, close to the population, and that's good. The only problem is like the quality of teaching, especially in some remote areas and also in some rural areas, is not really conducive to a better achievement at the middle school and the higher school. And that's one of the problems. So it's like the, the, the quality of the infrastructure, the quality of teaching, and also the, the poor conditions in which some of the teachers work, that affects like tremendously the primary education that is offered to kids. But at the same time, I mean, like those who have achieved like a quantitative, I mean, like access to all kids at the primary level then have faced the other challenge which is that of the middle school and the secondary school and the middle school i mean poses like more challenges because you cannot build middle schools in every kind of place and then because you have primary feeder schools and then you need to have a secondary school and that secondary school is not close by so that creates all kinds of problems with like transportation or you have to have dorms, you have to have like different kinds of mechanisms in order to make, uh, I mean, like kids go there. And and that raises problems for, especially for girls. And it has been mentioned in the report. I mean, like a lot of parents are very wary about like sending girls on bicycles or for example, on, on transport to far destinations for the secondary school or also going to the boarding school. Okay. That, that, that's why there is like very, very underachievement in terms of, I mean, like for girls uh, uh, at the secondary level, whereas the, the gap has been closed at the primary education level. It has been a little bit, I mean, like not closed at the secondary okay. level. Especially okay, Lassen, I, I, I just want to head into the, the last five or six minutes of the program, roughly. Manos Antoninus in Paris. Um, some of your contributors on the program today have used the word stakeholder. 
the report makes reference to kind of the idea of stakeholder involvement. Is that report speak, shorthand talk for governments don't really care or some governments don't really care? Because literally, if you're talking about some of the African countries or you're talking about some countries in the Middle East, you know, there are difficult political situations there. There are wars going on all the time and governments have to, they would say, I guess, stay focused on making sure their borders aren't breached as opposed to making sure that that 11 year old gets a good education. I think a key word is flexibility and partnership. And I think the report also says somewhere that essentially inclusion is an exercise in democracy. You have to decide what type of society you want to achieve. And education is a key lever for making that happen. So uh, when it comes to uh, issues of that kind, of course, there are so many political sensitivities. Uh, as I was mentioning earlier, minority issues, uh, refugee movements, uh, displaced people, um, uh, girls and how women are treated. And that's not only uh, in terms of um, putting them in plans, it's all through cutting across all areas of, of edu an education system, like the curriculum, uh, the, the, the language, of course, we cover already, but uh, the textbooks. How do you portray every group? Do you portray every group in the country on equal terms? Does someone feel uh, their own identity? Do they feel that they're uh, fairly described? If not, if children are feeling out, uh, they're feeling uh, that they're ridiculed or that they're essentially bullied in the textbook, then they're bullied in the classroom. And then their opportunity to learn is severely compromised. OK, uh, if just let me put my final point, please, to, man, uh, to Man Hatib in Kuala Lumpur. Man. We've talked about Southeast Asia, we've talked about South Asia, East Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, we've touched on other areas in Africa as well. Would it be fair to say, do you think, that if a country gets this right, everyone benefits because we all have a vested interest in having a population that have got either a good basic education or something layered on top of that, like a degree level qualification. But if a country gets this wrong, everyone suffers. Education is, the, is the, the best investment a country can do because uh, educated population will definitely contribute to the economy, uh, to the health sector. If, if we look at COVID-19 crisis, uh, we see the countries who had good education system managed to build good uh, health facilities and they managed to cope with, uh, with the crisis quite very, very well. In Malaysia, uh, things went very, very well. The, the crisis was managed uh, in a very, very good manner. And uh, it has been uh, globally recognized. And uh, definitely in Malaysia, like for example, Malaysia is investing a lot on, on in education, trying to make education accessible to uh, everyone, not, not only within um, uh, the, the Kuala Lumpur, the, the city, but even further to the uh, rural areas. There are challenges. And wherever we see challenges and we see lack of services, we see uh, issues uh, related to employability, related to uh, contribution to the, to the nation. So education is uh, having proper education, having inclusive education where everybody is um, provided with uh, that education and accessibility to, to schools, accessibility to universities, definitely that will contribute um, uh, very well to, to, the, to the country uh, from all aspects. Gentlemen, we'll have to leave it there, for which I apologise. It was a compelling, but I think generally a hopeful conversation. Thank you so much for your time today. Thanks to our guests. They were Manos Antoninus, Hassan Haddad and Man Al Khatib. And thank you too for your company. You can see the programme again anytime by going to our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story or tweet me. I'll tweet you back. I'm at Peter Dobby One. From me, Peter Dobby, and everyone on the team here in Doha. Thanks for watching. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye bye.